So good to talk with you again, Clark. Um, when we first spoke back 15 years or so ago uh, as an interview for the website of the Spiritual Bookstore in Woodstock, New York, what you said about your experience as a Westerner turned Buddhist only re to return again to your Western spiritual roots gave me validation to do the same. And like many post-war Americans, I'd become disenchanted with the Judeo-Christian path of my ancestors and followed, which was by the late 70s, already a well-worn path towards Eastern spirituality, only to find that path well-worn out for me a decade later. Uh, can you talk for those new to you about your journey towards Buddhism and back? Sure. Uh, you know, I was raised as a Christian down south. Uh, you know, my father required me to go to church every Sunday. And, you know, that, that worked for a while. I mean, you know, my family was uh, religious, not extremely so, but observant uh, Protestants. And, you know, when I was about, um, I'd say maybe 13 or 14, I started to notice that the most uh, – you know, the, the most vocal opponents of uh, the civil rights movement, or at least some of them, were the people sitting right next to me in the pews in church. And, uh, you know, I, the hypocrisy of that was, was very upsetting. And, you know, it came up in Sunday school discussions and stuff like that. And I remember once uh, saying in Sunday school, asking the Sunday school teacher's uh, car salesman and his wife, uh, you know, where exactly it said in the Bible that uh, uh, blacks couldn't marry whites, right, or that we ought to be uh, fighting the Vietnamese. And, you know, he actually sort of fumbled with the Bible like he was looking for the place where it said that, right? <laughs> but I guess word got back to my father because, uh, like, a couple of Sunday mornings later, he came into my room when it was time for the family to go to church and said he thought I was old enough to decide such matters for myself. <laughs> oh. So so I guess, you know, uh, I, I don't know whether I, I was coming too inquisitive or too opinionated or, or uh uh, you know, asking too many uncomfortable questions, but at that point I just sort of dropped out. So by the time I, um, by the time I hit college, I was, you know, still very much seeking and searching, but the, uh, you know, Judeo-Christian, uh, tradition of my upbringing didn't seem to have too much to offer. And, uh, so, you know, I, I guess I went through a period of, of very deep searching and seeking. It wasn't an altogether happy time. I remember I was uh, had a, a romantic disappointment uh, during my sophomore year in college, and it sort of threw me back on myself. I was doing a lot of walking, like hours and hours a day, and uh, often uh, in the middle of the night. And um, you know, it precipitated a kind of a spiritual crisis, which ultimately became a spiritual breakthrough. And because that breakthrough uh, occurred uh, when I was reading a book on Zen, somehow, you know, it sort of, I guess my former life sort of released me at that particular, you know, trajectory point, uh, you know, like a stone released from a sling. You know, I sort of followed that trajectory into Zen. And I had a lot of momentum behind me when I started, and it took years for that to sort of uh, play out. You know, this, this was the uh, 1970s. Uh, in 80s when, when, uh, Buddhism was really, you know, sort of getting ramped up in the culture, the, you know, outliers were all sort of following that path, or many of us were. And ultimately I ended up becoming a monk. But long about, I'd say, uh, 1988 or 89, you know, some degree of disillusionment began to, to set in. You know, it was a well-worn path by then, or was becoming so. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't really that. It wasn't suddenly that I had a lot, you know, of company on what before had been a somewhat, you know, more, you know, solitary or private path. It was more that I didn't see how it was really workable. You know, here was yet another tradition, in my case Zen, that didn't really bear much uh relation to the modern world. You know, people would go off on basically sort of you know, what what uh uh uh, one comic called an impossible vacation. You know, they, they take off for a week or so, go off to the mountains and meditate and come back to the life they had before. You know, very little change. And I saw this over and over again, both as a uh, lay student uh, and as a, as a monk and a teacher. 
And so I didn't really see how it, it meshed with realities of, of modern life. So long about 1990, I was really ready to bail. Um, you know, I hadn't really found uh, happiness in Zen. I found, uh, you know, a certain level of authority and success in it. Uh, I was, you know, leading my own temple and was on the verge of becoming a Zen master. Uh, but it hadn't made me happy and it, it hadn't... Um, left me feeling sort of rooted in the life I really had. It seemed to sort of take me out of the life I had. Um, so so I left. Uh, it took years after that to really find, uh, you know, a place where I felt I belonged, uh, over 20 years, in fact. And I wandered restlessly through all different uh, kinds of, of traditions. I'll say only one thing about my... Um, you know, return to the Judeo-Christian tradition. And, and it's not a return in any kind of nominal sense. I mean, I, I don't think of myself as religious. I don't belong to any church or, or synagogue or any kind of uh, uh, formal, organized sort of spiritual community. Uh, but nevertheless, there was one moment. My family and I were on a plane out of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, in the uh, late 90s. And we were in the air for about, I want to say, maybe 15 minutes, and the uh, <clears throat> cockpit caught on fire. We didn't know that at the time. Uh, the pilot did not have time to even make an announcement to that effect, and he simply put the plane into a controlled dive uh, so that he got back to the cl- as close to the ground as he could, as fast as he could. Uh, so that he could find a place to land it. Uh, as luck would have it, we weren't too far out, and so that place turned out to be back at the Memphis airport. But I think he would have had to land it on an expressway or someplace if he hadn't been able to get there. And when we landed, there were men on Mylar, you know, in Mylar suits pouring onto the plane. All the pilot said was, I guess everyone wants to get off. <laughs> and that was the first announcement from the cockpit or the flight crew or anything. It all happened in you know, under 10 minutes, and everyone was panicked. You know, everyone, including the flight attendants, who were all weeping, thought they were going to die. And, uh, you know, at that moment, you know, I was there with my whole family, you know, in the plane. And uh, what popped into my mind was not some Buddhist sutra or uh, or mantra or anything like that. I found myself saying the Jesus Prayer, which... Um, you know, I'd only read about this one little book, The Way of the Pilgrim, and it was the strangest sensation. I just can't tell you what that felt like. Uh, I lay awake all that night back in the hotel room in Memphis that the airline provided and uh, wondering where in the hell that had come from. Uh, I hadn't thought about, uh, certainly hadn't thought about Jesus, had no devotion to Jesus, had no particular faith in God or Jesus or, or anything Christian. Uh, but somehow, when my plane was falling out of the sky, you know, that was what popped into my mind. So I came back to Woodstock, and, you know, I guess I tried going to a the local Episcopal church, you know, for a while with my kids, and but that didn't seem to, you know, address, didn't seem to scratch me where I itched. That didn't, what didn't really explain, you know, for me what was going on. That was a very normative kind of religious experience with a lot of ritual and Sunday school and stuff like that. It wasn't that different from what I would had in the first place, a little bit more liberal, but, but not substantively different. And so um, eventually I sort of took matters into my own hands and I started a what I called a Koans of the Bible study group in uh, January of 2000. I put up a sign basically saying that uh, anyone who wanted to could come every Thursday night and read the Bible like a question instead of an answer, uh, treating it uh, like, a, like a Zen koan. Like, why does, uh, you know, why is Abraham willing to kill his son? What's that about? You know, that's a, that's a, that's a koan. That's, that's not a, like an article of faith. That's a puzzle that stuns the mind. So anyway, you know, that Thursday night, you know, like 50 people showed up. And, uh, over the years, it's winnowed down to, uh, I guess, you know, somewhere around a dozen or so people. And now we're a rosary group, uh, rather than, um, a Bible study group, but we've been meeting continuously ever since. And so there's a sort of a small community uh, format that follows no particular uh, religious agenda, uh, 
but which allows people to come and simply, you know, come as they are and bring what they have and, uh, you know, not have to leave their questions at the door and things like that and, and get together and, you know, share, share their spiritual lives with one another. And that sort of is what works for me now. So it's not really a return so much to the, it's not a return to the uh, tradition that I left. It's not a circle, in other words. It's more like a spiral. It ended up in a slightly different place than I was before. You know, although, you know, of course, we pray the rosary, and that's a, uh, you know, that's a, you know, a Catholic tradition. We're not Catholic. But so there is some similarity to it. But uh, at the same time, it's different. Uh, two things. One, you talked about the questioning aspect in the uh, Cohen's of the Bible. That seems similar to the way uh, in Judaism how we kind of look at the, 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 the Torah or readings in the Torah more, more as a as a question than an answer. So there's some similarity I see there. Um, and you, you mentioned about how when you were walking in the dark um, in college looking for an answer, and that kind of brings us to uh, your new book, which is uh, called Waking Up in the Dark, Ancient Wisdom for a, Sleep, for a Sleepless Age. Uh, where your basic thesis is, is that awakening in the middle of the night is perfectly normal and, in fact, it's our birthright, and that the sanctity of the, the quiet and the darkness of the night allows us the possibility to connect more effectively with the spiritual world, and the key factor here being the dark. Am I, am I close to what you're putting forth in the book? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, from the time I was very young, I would wake up in the middle of the night. Um, I think Probably when I was little, my parents put me to, you know, to bed right around dusk. And uh, it's natural for human beings to, you know, in the absence of excess uh, illumination, the absence of artificial lights, it's natural for human beings to lie in bed for an hour or so before falling to sleep, to sleep for four hours, to wake for two and to sleep for four hours more. That's called, uh, you know, divided sleep. Um, the ancients called it the first and second sleep, the references to it in the Upanishads and Homer and the Bible. And this was the pattern of sleep that governed uh, human behavior around the planet until very, very recently. Our modern habit of uh, staying up late, you know, aided by, you know, stimulating effects of uh, modern incandescent lighting has c- compressed and consolidated our sleep into a single eight-hour block, but that's not a natural way to sleep. And in fact, uh, there are many benefits to sleeping in two blocks. Uh, for one thing, it's just more natural. Our endocrinology, uh, everything about our bodies uh, is designed to do that, somehow kind of mesh or sync with the natural rhythms of, uh, of the planet, you know, which are governed primarily by the presence and absence of sunlight. And so, um, you know, one of the things for me, you know, growing up, I guess, I, you know, I, I did this. I would wake up and wander on the golf course when I was a little boy, you know. My parents didn't know about it because, of course, they were asleep like everybody else. Um, and then all the way through high school and then through college, um, it wasn't until, you know, I was in my 30s and had kids that I began to wonder if, you know, wow, maybe, you know, something is, something's amiss here. Maybe there's something, you know, wrong with my, uh, you know, brain chemistry that I'm, that I'm following, following this pattern. And on about that time, a man at the National Institute of Mental Health named Thomas Ware, a sleep researcher, he was the guy who, uh, discovered seasonal affective disorder. He did an experiment where he uh, took uh, about a dozen or so people off the streets, just ordinary people, and he took them off all artificial lighting for one month. And he put them basically on a midwinter schedule of sleep. So we're talking basically about 14 hours of darkness. And what he discovered was that for the first three weeks of the experiment, people would sleep about maybe an hour longer every night, but they would sleep continuously straight through, through the night as they were used to doing. And uh, But then at week three, every subject in the study began to follow a pattern of divided sleep. They would lie in bed quietly for about two hours, uh, then fall asleep, sleep for four hours, wake for two hours, and sleep for another four before getting up with, uh, with the sun. And uh, People told him, and people who were the subjects of his experiment told him that 
they had never experienced anything like those two hours in the middle of the night. They felt peaceful. They felt still. They felt content and happy. And during the day, they felt more awake than they'd ever been. So Ware began to look into this, and he discovered that, in fact, this uh, these two hours in the middle of the night uh, had an integral analogy all their own. In other words, this was a state of mind these people were waking to that had been suppressed from the modern repertoire. Uh, what I discovered, you know, is when I read this study, of course, I felt very confirmed. I thought, oh, my gosh, well, this is what I've been experiencing all my life. So I began to research it, and I discovered evidence of it in religious texts of the world, uh, in Judaism, uh, Tikkun Hitzot, uh, and, you know, the Hasidic practice of Hitbuddha, getting up in the middle of the night to talk and to talk to God. Uh, it's in the Hindu tradition. Uh, it's in the Buddhist tradition. Every tradition has uh, a practice of waking in the middle of the night for prayer. And this is a time uh, when the various lamas and imams and rabbis and roshis and lamas all tell us that they feel particularly blessed, uh, realized, loved, or held. Uh, and so at that point, when I began to discover these texts, I thought, well, I, I really need to write about this. I need to tell people about this because it really is their birthright. That's what Thomas Ware said. He said that modern human beings have lost their, what he called their birthright. This is a scientist talking. I mean, you read this, you read this study and you read his results and he's, he's starting to sound like a Jungian analyst or a mystic. So it's, uh, this, I guess this is how a scientist gets religion. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is that um, I don't I don't think the the uh, the notion of waking up in the middle of the night is uh, is, is that far into uh, you know anybody wants to get in, in, into point of adulthood that seems to be sort of the the the, 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 the common experience and people treat it as, as an ailment of course as medication for right. that um, right. you know my experience is that uh, waking up in in that time of the night which I often do. Is that one? I feel more more clear, and you know, it, it, you know, as far in the creative process. But then I also feel that when 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 the when the fear is present, it also feels more sensitive uh, at yeah. that hour as well. Yeah, well, that's right. And uh, the first part of waking up to the dark is called the hour of the wolf, and it looks into that phenomenon. I think what happens is that you know, as we get older, uh, it is harder to override our biological impulse to wake in the middle of the night. Uh, when you're young, uh, when you can stay up late, uh, when you can use artificial light and caffeine and other stimulants to, you know, burn the candle at both ends and compress and consolidate your sleep, uh, it's easier. But as you get older and your metabolic force begins to uh, ebb somewhat, it's harder to override it until you begin to wake up in the middle of the night. The really, the really weird thing is, and tragic in many ways, is that, uh, the modern, uh, uh, pharmacological industry, big pharma, uh, is very, very committed to this idea that what it calls, uh, insomnia or sleep fragmentation is an unnatural state that needs to be medicated when in fact what happens is as you get older, you wake up in the middle of the night, not because there's anything wrong with you, but because you're supposed to. And most people only need to be told that. And, uh, you know, the typical letter that I get from somebody who's read Waking Up to the Dark is, oh, my God, you know, I used to wake up and feel so anxious, and now I wake up and I feel peace instead and clarity. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's of course, very gratifying. I'm so happy to hear that because I understand. I felt that way, too, when I... Uh, you know, was having kids and, you know, suddenly the financial pressures were greater and, you know, there was more on the line and I would wake up to what I call the hour of the wolf is in, instead of the hour of God, which is, you know, the way I tend to experience it now. Yeah, it's interesting because when, when you speak with adults and, you know, we were at a family gathering over the weekend, oftentimes the, the, the question of not getting a full night's sleep is present, so it's something that speaks to I think most ad adults, especially in, a, in, in the modern culture, about about this whole notion that we need to get a full sort of eight hours rest. So I, I think that's right. it's 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 such a great uh, uh, conversation that, that you know people should be picking up and reading the book, and uh, you know at the end we'll 
uh, let people know the name again and where they can get it. Um, I'm curious in your take on Pope Francis, uh, you know, his recent encyclical, which most people seem to think is about climate change, but actually threads the needle connecting the climate, global poverty, back to unbridled capitalism. Uh, do you think, uh, like many in America, that he's overstepping his role as a religious leader in getting so deep in geopolitics? Well, no. I, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a very loaded question, so I'll, I'll try to unpack the different parts of it. But here's the thing. You know, people like to uh, segregate uh, their religion from their greed. And so you have people, for instance, who can, uh, you know, say that uh, they're very, very committed to their religion. At the same time, uh, you know, they, they, their behavior actually opposes its, its basic principles. We've seen that in America over the past several decades with the Christian right. Uh, you know, Al Sharpton said once fam- famously that, you know, he needed to introduce the Christian right to the right Christians, right? <laughs> so the idea being that, you know, the Christian right is is uh, its own relationship, its relationship to its own Christian morality is so dissonant that, you know, unless these people call themselves Christians, you couldn't look at their behavior or look at them and find anything even remotely Christian about them in many cases, other than the fact that they go to church. So it's really a kind of a political or economic stance that they've taken and a very conservative one. So I I think that, you know, that is a defensive statement. Uh, People's criticisms of Pope Francis are are really tell us less about Pope Francis and much more about themselves. People who criticize him for taking a stance on climate change, uh, you know, are the people who themselves are, you know, running scared from the realities of modern life and how it's going to to, uh, impact them uh, uh, politically. Uh, economically, psychologically, whatever. I gave a talk a few years ago and got myself in a lot of trouble because I, I said to a very large group of people that I didn't believe that there were very many educated people left in the world today who didn't believe in climate change. The problem was uh, not whether they believed in it or not, but they couldn't answer the question for themselves, what do I do if climate change is real? In other words, these were people who knew it was real and continued to deny it because they couldn't answer the question, what do I do if it's real? They didn't know the answer to that. Like, they didn't have an answer. Like, how is my life going to change? You know, like, like how is my how is it going to affect my bank account? How is, uh, uh, you know, how is it going to affect my uh, hope for the future and my hope for my children's happiness if this is real? Because they couldn't answer that question. And the question itself or the potential answers were so alarming. Uh, they chose to deny it instead. But that's not quite the same as believing it. If you think about it, you know, we say that a person is in denial. A person who's in denial is is not disconnected from the truth. They actually know the truth. They're actively involved in denying the truth. And I think that the climate deniers are like that. I will tell you this. You put me alone in a room with any climate denier in the world, and an hour later, Two, one of two things will happen. They'll either either punch me out or they'll leave the room in tears because it just there just there's no two ways about it. Okay, this is real. This is happening. You know, people people need to be held uh, while they answer that question or while they ask that question and answer it for themselves. Some people, other people are, you know, sort of brave or courageous enough to sort of face it head on. So that part of the question then. I guess my summary would be this. Pope Francis is is behaving, you know, basically like a Christian. You know, he's looking at this 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 huge threat uh to humanity and especially to the poor and he's he's trying to take it head on. It isn't just about climate change, it is about poor, it is about uh economic inequality. You know, there 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 are there are many issues at stake. You, know, you, you spoke about two different groups of people there, one, the climate deniers, but then also the one more interesting to me is the people who do believe in climate change, 
but uh, don't want to acknowledge it because of fear of what to do about it. And um, and that group, you know, despite that urgency that's expressed by Francis and, and others who are awake to the multiple crises surrounding climate, environment, economics, poverty, race relations, and, you know, m- many people I know, they pay little attention to these crises. And they seemingly prefer to hide under the blanket, the, to me, seem to be pseudo-spiritual practices. And they speak in this language of you know, universal abundance, positive thinking, gratitude, these platitudes, and, and, and to a degree whereby modern spirituality has shown up as nothing more an excuse for hedonistic narcissism. And, and when I mention Francis and the cyclical to, to, to these friends, you know, I, I get criticism of you know, the church's historic treatment of women, scandals involving priests. And I don't know if the dynamic that you see within that group, and if so, what do you think that play here? I I think that uh, Francis is doing the best he can with, uh, you know, to to turn a very very big ship. You know, when you're driving, uh, <laughs> when you're when you're steering an ocean liner, you know, you can't turn it on a dime. Uh, you know, if you want to bring it to a stop, you have to start cutting the engines and, you know, reversing the propellers 10 miles out. So, um, it's not like Francis is just going to suddenly, you know, declare, uh, you know, a change in church doctrine and the Catholic Church will follow. We've seen what, he, what, what happens when he tries to move, uh, you know, more quickly than he can. He gets a lot of blowback. I do believe that um, it is his intention to radically reform the church. Okay, there's a, there's a wonderfully sort of penitent quality about him, despite the fact that he's quite joyous. He's always smiling. He he seems to sort of look on the brighter side of things. You know, although he's certainly willing to confront uh, you know corruption and uh, and hypocrisy within the church when he sees it. But I, I think there is a penitent quality about his papacy. You know, he's he's looked at the church. Uh, it, it's behavior historically, and he's seen that there are a lot of problems, and uh, he's trying to right those. So, yes, obviously, you know, I, for instance, you know, he, he said, uh, I think it was uh, last week maybe, he issued a statement about uh, abortion uh, saying that uh, priests should be allowed uh, to offer absolution to women who've had abortions, provided they are contrite. Well, that rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> you know, I'm not satisfied with that, and I don't think you know, uh, uh, you know, many uh, Catholics in recovery, especially women who, for whatever reason, have had have, have abortions, are going to feel very good about that. You know, the idea that they have to go and express their contrition before some priest who's never had to struggle with the issue of abortion personally uh, and never will by virtue of his profession, his celibacy, and and uh, and his sex, his gender. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, clearly he's trending in the direction of, of some kind of major uh, uh, change within the church. And so I, I, I think you have to, um, you know, this is my in, uh, inclination in any way to cut him a little slack and, and uh, to be sort of impatiently patient <laughs> with, his, yeah. with his agenda, which seems to be, you know, headed in the right direction as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah, so there's that. Now the the, like, the the first part of that question uh, yeah. is 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 also interesting to me, and I and and I'd like to get a little feedback from you on is, is to sort of where this sort of uh, this spiritual but not religious or this community of people who feel somehow um, it's it's speaking in 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 in, in my uh, estimation to a magical thinking quality uh, okay. and offers people this sort of uh, you know the sort of bait which is um, not spiritual at all, but seems to be right. rather a big distraction. Well, you know, I have, I have a, a sort of an interesting take on that uh, because I've been inside a lot of those communities, um, you know, not as, uh, you know, not always as a participant, but as an observer. But in some cases, I've really sort of gone in, inside of those communities and sort of seen what they what they have to offer. I, I think that uh, it's okay to say that, you know, there's kind of a self-absorbed, you know, spiritual narcissism at play, but I think that the the bigger, broader trend uh, in which we're all trapped, and not just these people, is an anthropocentrism. The fact of the matter is that, you know, I mean, we can call it magical thinking if we want, you know, this, you know, these, uh, uh, this abundance, uh, uh, spirituality and all that. 
But the fact of the matter is that if you do interviews with the people who uh, subscribe to this and really believe it and practice it, you know, you'll find that they have a lot of what uh, uh, Nishiren Buddhists call actual proof to back that up. In other words, these are people oftentimes who are, you know, down and out or down at the heel and uh, sort of pick themselves up and develop a more sort of positive, faith-filled approach to life and have begun some sort of practice chanting or praying or whatever and have experienced, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, elevation of their life condition. I've seen this countless times. I've, I've interviewed hundreds of people who report this. And they're very credible stories. And I've experienced it myself. So, uh, you know, in the absence of some church that is obviously run by a corrupt individual who's just like, you know, bilking people of their money and promising if they give a lot of money to, uh, you know, to the, the church that they're going to get tons of money in return and stuff like that, that's, that's not really uh, abundance thinking. That's just, you know, standard, uh, uh, <laughs> that's just sort of standard American huckster, religious hucksterism. That's been around for a long time. Uh, but in the essence of that, you know, I think a lot of these communities are actually, uh, are actually pretty credible. The real problem and the real question is that doesn't really solve the overarching problem. In other words, you know, you can elevate your life condition, but if you're on board the Titanic, the ship is still going down. And I think that it is the failure of a lot of these communities to deal with the darker realities of, of 21st century living, climate change, uh, uh, diminishing water supplies, uh, you know, tremendous inequities of wealth, alarming inequities of wealth, uh, inec- levels of inequity like nothing we've seen in a culture that uh, uh, that didn't end up in revolution, a bloody revolution. So we're we're in we're in pretty bad we're in pretty bad trouble in America right now. You know, as long as um, the price of bread is not too high and there's gas to put in our cars and the electricity is on. And uh, the political process isn't uh, too egregiously, obviously corrupt, uh, then, you know, people will, you know, sort of continue to do as they they are told. But uh, if any one of those things, you know, suddenly goes south, you know, we're looking at that uh, rapidly, uh, you know, rapidly deteriorating uh, uh, social structures and political structure in this country. That could happen easily. You know, uh, someone told me the other day that, you know, Lenin uh, wrote to uh, his fa- a family member or a friend six weeks before the Re- Russian Revolution and said, uh, we'll probably never see political change uh, in my lifetime. Okay? The six weeks. So here's the leader of the revolution. Couldn't see it coming. Couldn't predict it. So... I think the fact that uh, you can, you know, have faith and pray and elevate your own life condition is a very good thing. And, uh, you know, most people who are engaged in a life of prayer, if it's not some sort of a hothouse flower contemplative prayer that's like, you know, the equivalent of living in a cave on one meal a day, I think that, you know, anyone engaged in a life of prayer is engaged, uh, you know, at the level of sort of, you know, maintaining uh you know, their their health and their family and things like that, and that's fine. But to use that to um, self-medicate and to, uh, as a way of avoiding the larger realities of life, I think is, um, is a pre- it creates a, a precarious uh, spiritual house of cards that's bound to get blown down when the time comes. You know, I, I, I noticed that, own dynamic. Uh, my my daughter and I had, were members of a synagogue, um, you know, while she was going to school. And right around the time, well, right after the time of Hurricane Katrina, when the federal government was totally unable to deal with relief efforts, uh, our synagogue was part of the larger movement of reform congregations that had a relief effort, along with churches, along with mosques, that were able to, you know, action on the ground, bring relief efforts. In a way right. that, in, in a non-engaged spiritual community, was not happening. Right, exactly. Yeah, you don't see. You know, I, I wrote an article for Huff Post, uh, I guess, last year sometime, uh, talking about the fact that uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's fine to like go to a yoga class and call that your spiritual community, 
you know, but when push comes to shove and you get really sick, your yoga teacher is going to show up with a casserole at your door. Uh, a friend of mine who's a leader in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, Soka Gakkai, which is a large, uh, uh, Buddhist, very socially engaged Buddhist sect in America, I asked him one time, uh, you know, Bill, uh, you know, what's, what's, uh, Soka Gakkai's, you know, secret? What's your secret weapon? And he laughed and he said, well, we have great casserole ladies. <laughs> and, and, and he said, he added in men, you know, in men too, good casserole men, but, and I said, well, who is that? And he says, oh, well, those are the people who show up without being asked and, and when you try to turn them away, won't listen, at your door when you're sick or when you've lost your job or when you're experiencing some, you know, uh, sudden setback or, um, uh, or grief. And they show up with a casserole and come in and set it down, heat it up for you, feed you, make sure you're okay. And these are the people who, uh, you know, really count when the going gets tough. You know, these are the people who, who intervene, people who are really there for you. And I think that um, the spiritual but not religious crowd in America, you know, this, this, is, this is a movement that is, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide. Uh, it really does not have the depth uh, that people need. Uh, during tough times, uh, you know, either culturally, cultural tough times like a depression or a recession or a, uh, you know, major, uh, ecological disaster, uh, or the, the personal hard times, you know, when you, you suffer a lot. So, you know, your yoga teacher's probably not going to marry you or bar- bury you or christen your child either. So, uh, you know, what's needed, I think, now is, is something that's Spiritual, but not religious, but not shallow. That's really, I think, where uh, the movement at its best is headed. These are the people who have broken with the uh, religion of their youth, uh, or maybe the religion of their grandparents. In many cases, their parents didn't raise them with any religion, but it's there somewhere in the, uh, you know, in that suitcase that was brought from the old country, uh, disused, like an old icon painting or an old. Uh, uh, you know, mezuzah or something like that, but it's still there. Uh, so they, they left that behind because it no longer really served them. It didn't address the realities of their lives as modern people. And so, but they still have spiritual needs, and so they pursued some sort of, you know, spiritual but not religious alternative. But as they get older, and it's mostly been, you know, baby boomers who have, you know, fueled that that boom in the spiritual, not religious uh, demographic. As they get older, they start to face the realities, you know, the Buddha face, the sickness, old age, and death. And as they run up against those, they find that the patchwork of spiritual practices and, you know, nightstand books by the Dalai Lama and such things, you know, really aren't enough. They need more. What they need in essence is spiritual community. And, uh, and so they're, they're looking for that. That's really what gives you, uh, the depth that you need in order to, to lead a, I think an, an authentic, uh, spiritual life. You need to have some kind of spiritual community, not, not some massive organized, uh, affair, uh, but something intimate, probably local and real. Great. Well, thanks for that, Clark. Um, I wanted to mention again your book, Waking Up to the Dark, Ancient Wisdom for a Sleepless Age, and that's available at people's favorite independent bookstore, I assume? It is. It is available, you know, all the usual sources, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, your your local bookseller to uh, Powell's to, you know, Barnes & Noble, and, you know, I guess as a last resort, that, you know, great uh Corporate Serpent Amazon, but yes, uh, they, you know, people can get it uh, just about any place. Great. Well, thanks so much for your time and for your thoughts, and uh, hopefully we'll speak again soon. Very good, Craig. It was a pleasure talking to you again.